Good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to what is the 37th annual Steer Not Lecture that we're delivering through the College of Arts and Sciences. And, and welcome Dr. Bloom, our distinguished speaker today. Um, Professor Boletsky let me know that I'm only supposed to speak for a couple of minutes. And if you know academics, you know that's a cruel joke to plan an academic to say you only have a few minutes, but I will certainly comply uh, with the request. And I, I want to thank everybody who's joined us today, including our, our provost, Deborah Leibowitz, uh, members of our faculty, deans of other schools at Quinnipiac, many of our, our students and community members, too, who um, are joining us. And thanks to our colleagues in the Department of Political Science and Philosophy for organizing uh, this important event, but also for sustaining this really important and critical tradition of inviting public intellectuals to our campus and academicians and, and sparking these uh, really reflective, critical conversations with extended members of our community. I'm sure it's probably exactly what Alfred Stiernot had in mind when he inaugurated philosophy in the curriculum at Quinnipiac more than 50 years ago today. And for the past 37 years, this speaker series has been funded and supported through an endowment named after Alfred Sternot, um, supported by members of his family and supported by members of the Quinnipiac community and donations that have come into the College of Arts and Sciences. What I appreciate most about a lecture series like this as well is that it makes philosophy accessible to everyone, accessible to the people. It's grounded in the materiality of our everyday lives. It's not just a, a cosmic and esoteric practice dealing with concept, but it's a philosophy for the people that really helps to examine everyday events and raise philosophical questions about important issues of our times. And I know that Dr. Bloom uh, will do that today following uh, the, the tradition of the ancients, uh, particularly the ancient Greeks. We all know the famous expression um, spoken through the mouth of Socrates and, and through the pen of Plato in the pol Apology that uh, the unexamined life or a life that is not examined is really one that's not worth living for anybody. And that is really what this speaker series helps us to do is um, examine those philosophical issues that are, are pertinent to our daily existence. Uh, I would like to invite our distinguished professor, Anat Boletsky, professor of philosophy and women's studies, our Schweitzer professor of philosophy and women's studies, to introduce our distinguished speaker today. And thank you all for, for being here. Anat. Thank you, Adam. You took the words right out of my mouth. No, you didn't. I hadn't thought of Plato or Aristotle today, and I thank you very much for bringing them into our discussion, not to mention Socrates, of course. Um, it's really important to note what Adam said, and why does this keep running away from me? And as many of you know, the Sternot Lectures have been one of the opening events of our school years here at Quinnipiac. It was originally thought of as the mark of the contribution or the gift of philosophy to Quinnipiac University and to a Quinnipiac University education. The Sternot Lecture has also, perhaps less formally, but still traditionally and definitely in the last few years, become the context in which we connect philosophy to not just the campus, but to real life, to political, social, economic, real settings, real situations. I know I say this every year, but this year I mean it even more so, or maybe I mean it every year, but I always think of it as so important for us. This year, philosophy, is dealing with real circumstances, real surroundings, real challenges, real crises. And that is the word that I think of most often, that we are in a crisis, that we are living through crises, uh, more so I think than several other years that I can think of. Um, not only are we joining though philosophy to real life, but we're doing it as part of an educational institution. 
And that gives me the opportunity here to note and thank the Quinnipiac School of Education, who, because of the subject of this year's talk, have joined us in sponsoring this. So it's always been philosophy and arts and sciences, and now it's philosophy, arts and sciences, and education. Our speaker, as the posters or the invitations say, is Professor Lawrence Blum Larry, to many people. He's professor of philosophy and distinguished professor of liberal arts and education at UMass Boston. Uh, in this day and age, you can just look him up on the net and actually see everything that I could say or would maybe need to say in a formal introduction. Um, you find on the net his participation in conferences, his public and academic talks in oh so many venues. Uh, you see the names of his courses, for instance. I could just go on about that forever and ever. Um, and if I attempted to do that, I would spend this whole talk in listing, listing titles, listing names, listing books, listing people. Um, so the only list I want to really take out of all sorts of uh, past encounters and knowledge that we have of Larry's CV, as it's called here always, is the list of subjects, philosophical subjects, in which he deals. Um, first of all, moral philosophy, then moral psychology, then social and political philosophy, moral education and philosophy of education, Holocaust, film and TV, film, TV, and race, and of course, race on its own. For us today, it's the congruence of race and education, which is so necessary and so painfully exciting. Am I allowed to say that? Painfully exciting. Well, I've done this before and I'll do it again now, and that is tell you the titles of some of his articles on the subject that he'll be talking about today race in general and race in education in particular, just to give you an inkling of what it is that we're in for. And these are just the outstanding ones that I picked up almost by chance. Um, here are some titles. Stereotyping versus Black Lives Matter. Moral frames for understanding the police killings. Moral asymmetries in racism. Racism, what it is and what it isn't. Stereotypes and stereotyping, a moral analysis. Racial integration in a multicultural age. What do accounts of racism do? Three types of race-related solidarity. White privilege, a mild critique. I love that. <laughs> a mild critique. Racialized groups, the socio-historical consensus, cultural racism. Biology and that's the same one, cultural racism, biology and culture and racist thought. This goes on and on. But notice, I haven't picked out the explicit writings on race and education. And this is where I come in on a different aspect of Larry's work. Let me for just a minute note these elements of Larry's accomplishments that are not to my mind, and this might be only me, um, exclusively academic those that connect his activism and his philosophy, those who make him who he is. I'm referring to here um, the book that he wrote in 2002, which is was when I first encountered him, the book called I'm Not a Racist, But. I want to say that again, I'm not a racist, but. And then there's a subtitle, The Moral Quandary of Race. But I'm not a racist, but I remember seeing that on someone's shelf and taking a spin. Um, that book was chosen as Social Philosophy Book of the Year by the North American Society for Social Philosophy. I think that was the organization. It's approximately then, at the beginning of the aughts, that Larry began to teach a course on race and racism at the local public high school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a school known for diversity, for minorities, for many special characteristics. For his report on that, 
and the philosophical, that is philosophy of education, results of that, I always turn to another book called High Schools, Race, and America's Future, which was published in 2012, 10 years later. And then fast forward another almost 10 years, we get integrations, the struggle for racial equality and civic renewal in public education, which came out last year and which I had thought to ask Larry to talk about before thinking of Sternacht. So you could say this is a book talk, but it's not. It is definitely based on this amazing book, Integrations. So let me welcome Larry to tell us about his current very inspiring thoughts and work. Thank you. Larry. Well, thank, thank you, huh, Harry. I'm very pleased to be here. I've never been to Quinnipiac before, and I'm honored to be the Stiernot lecturer. Um, so the, the, the book is about two different things, racial integration in education and racial equality and inequality in education and the connection between those. What is their connection? To approach these questions, let me define integrationism. Integrationism is the view that bringing racially distinct populations together in the same educational spaces is the key to ridding our schools and school systems of the vast racial and class disparities that plague them. Integration, integration, then, is the magic bullet of school reform aimed at achieving equality. By the way, for people in education, the term equity has come to sort of replace the way I'm using the word equality, and I'll go back and forth between the two. I don't think, I think it's more of a semantic issue. So in my view, integrationism is wrong. Segregation, rightly understood, does not cause inequality or inequity. White supremacy, as I will define it, does. Integration on its own does not come anywhere near bringing about educational equality. Viewing segregation as the fundamental cause of inequality has had three unfortunate effects. I'm going to list them, but I can only talk about two of them, but they're all discussed in the book. One, it has diverted us from what is really required to bring about educational equality, which involves not only what goes on inside schools, but necessary changes in our society within which schools are set. Second point, it has missed the true value of integration, which is civic in character. The integrated school is an optimal setting for education for social justice that should be a central plank in civic education to prepare students for their roles as stewards of our precious multiracial democracy, which is currently under threat. And the third point, integration has encouraged the neoliberal view that disadvantaged students of color can receive equal educations by being in the proximity of advantaged white students in integrated schools and classrooms. So let me now turn to white supremacy, which I'm saying is the basic root cause of educational inequality. The term white supremacy is used in several distinct ways. And there are three primary ones, probably not, you know, there are probably others as well. The first is a historical meaning in which it refers to uh, Jim's, Jim Crow segregation, that's a social order that held primarily in the southern states of the U.S. between around 1890 and 1960. A social order upheld by law in which whites are the dominant group, and the social order reflects an ideology that, white, that whites deserve the dominance this social order grants them because whites are a superior race. That's one meaning of white supremacy, historical meaning. A second meaning is that it refers to the ideology 
of white supremacy as just a kind. And people who adhere to that ideology who are called uh, white supremacists. And this I, uh, white supremacy in this sense was on display in the 2017 Charlottesville demonstrations of white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia, and to some extent in the January 6th, 2021 insurrection at the Capitol. Uh, white supremacists are whites who want to establish a social order in which whites are dominant, of which Jim Crow segregation was one form, but not the only possible form of, of uh, the ideology of white supremacy. And the third meaning of white supremacy, which is the one that I will primarily be employing, is white supremacy in the sense um, it, it was elaborated by Charles Mill. Sorry. Mills was a Jamaican philosopher who spent most of his career in the U.S. and thought about white supremacy in very constructive and uh, imaginative ways. He died last September. Mills recognizes white supremacy of types one and two that I just mentioned, and he doesn't think that the U.S. is still uh, is white supremacists in the Jim Crow sense. White supremacy in Mills's sense refers to a social order in which whites are unjustly advantaged over people of color, brown, black, and indigenous, especially across many societal domains, income and wealth, health, occupation, residence, education, and so on. Mills thought you could not understand why we currently have a white supremacist social order in that sense, which he thought we did, without seeing it as an outgrowth and a legacy of historical slavery, colonialism, and segregation, all propped up by a white supremacist ideology. But the current form of white supremacy, that is Mills's sense of it, does not require that ideology. It does not require that uh, you know broad stretches of white people agree with that ideology. And many white people who are advantaged, advantaged in our current system have those unfair advantages without necessarily believing that they deserve to do so. Nor is the kind of white supremacy Mills was pointing to upheld explicitly by law. It is de facto rather than de jure, to use the legal terminology. These are important differences between Mills' sense of white supremacy and the Jim Crow sense. You could, however, say that white supremacy in Mills' sense is upheld by law in that white unjust advantage is not, in general, actually illegal. It is not illegal, for example, for whites to hold eight times as much wealth as blacks. It, um, for example, that isn't illegal. It's not, it's not upheld in the way Jim Crow segregation is, but it's legally permitted. White, white supremacy in Mills's sense is factual. That is, we can point to and often quantify these racial disparities in those different social domains that I mentioned but with the added moral judgment that the disparities are unjust or unfair. But white supremacy in Mills's sense does not mean certain things that it could be con confused with. White supremacy is about groups as a whole, not about each member of the groups. It is not saying that all white people are advantaged over all black and brown people. Some black people are in the top 1% of income and wealth. Many white people are in the bottom 10%. White supremacy is only saying that white people are on average advantaged over black and brown people. For example, the median individual income, that's kind of one measure, is 30,000 uh, 30, for Latinx, 35,000 for blacks, and 50,000 for whites. Second point, white supremacy is only one system of advantage in our society. Someone who's racially advantaged, that is in comparison to other races, could be disadvantaged on some other dimensions like class or gender. A wealthy white woman could be advantaged by her wealth but disadvantaged by her gender. The third point is that to talk about white supremacy in Mills' sense 
is not to say that someone is racist. Being advantaged and being racist are two different things. To be unjustly advantaged does not mean to be prejudiced against black and brown people. It doesn't mean to look down on them or to stereotype them. It's important to, to emphasize this since, as I said, white supremacy in the second meaning, the ideological meaning, does refer to people's um, beliefs or ideology. So white supremacy in that sense does refer to being racist in a standard understanding of what that means, but not in no sense. No sense does not involve beliefs or ideologies or attitudes. It involves your socioeconomic positionality. Okay, so what are the processes? So, so you've got this um, social order in which whites are advantaged, but what creates that so social order? Well, obviously, that's a huge topic, you know, beyond my scope, but I do want to make some kind of general. Uh, observations about those processes. First of all, both race and class-based processes contribute to the disparities between racial groups. An obvious example from the present is the way that COVID has had a disproportionately negative impact on Black, Latinx, and indigenous communities. This is so for several different reasons. Just one of them, is that lower income jobs are among the least safe during this pandemic. So this is a class-based process, but at the same time, if certain racial groups disproportionately occupy those jobs, they will be disproportionately harmed by exposure to the virus, and that's in fact what happened. In, in a sense, then, a class-based process is contributing to race-based injustice and thus to white supremacy in those sense. Point two, class and race are complementary, not competing explanations. For various reasons, people often want to reject either race or class explanations in favor of the other one, and to want to say that it must be either racial processes or class processes creating the disparity, but not both. However, usually, not always, but usually, it is a combination of both. And we should be comfortable with that more complex race and class explanation of injustice. Martin Luther King Jr. looked at it this way and saw the mass of blacks as studying from as suffering from a combination of race and class-based injustices, not racial ones alone, despite the reputation King has for only being concerned about race. And he consistently advocated. Oh, I hope you I hope you all heard that earlier part of the talk. Is this is this one working? Is this better or or is this one okay? Yeah. We'll go like this. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Um, so, so King consistently advocated for economic reforms such as jobs programs and a robust property program that would benefit members of all races who were in poverty, though benefiting blacks disproportionately because they were disproportionately represented among the poor. The third point. Another way of thinking about Mills's understanding of white supremacy is that it is really naming the same situation that is much more familiar, familiarly stated in relation to blacks as black as black disadvantage. However, blacks cannot be disadvantaged except in comparison to another group that's advantaged. But if whites are not mentioned in the advantage-disadvantage system, it seems to suggest that the reason blacks are disadvantaged doesn't have anything to do with white people, but only with blacks themselves. Calling it white supremacy when, as Mills does, we separate that from both historical segregation and from con contemporary Trumpian white supremacists puts whites definitively into the picture as beneficiaries of a system in which blacks, Latinxes, and indigenous people are disadvantaged. On my view, class and race inequalities in social resources, which is what white supremacy is, are the fundamental source of inequities in education, 
not segregation. There are two fundamental categories of resources bearing on whether a school can successfully educate its students, in-school resources and student family resources. Both are crucial sources of the race and class inequities that cause educational injustice. And I'll just give examples here. So in, in school resources refers to familiar aspects of schooling, the physical condition of the school, the quality of its teachers, the stability of its teaching force, services provided in the school, all of which depend on the financial resources available to a school. Because our education system funds schools primarily through property taxes, there's a built-in inequity in resources available to schools. Wealthier communities have better funded schools than poor and working class communities. This inequity is entirely familiar and it has both a racial and a class character. This is one deep way that inequities in the wider society translate into inequity in the education system. At one time, school resources of this kind were thought to be the only way that social inequities in the wider society translated into educational inequities. The Coleman Report of 1966 changed all that. Commissioned by the federal government as part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, this classic study showed that families' own resources affected children's school performance independent of but together with differences in school resources. Subsequent studies have only confirmed Coleman's basic point here, though the manifold paths by which socioeconomic advantage and disadvantage translates into educational advantage and disadvantage are now much better understood than Coleman and his team did. The basic idea is that two students may have the same innate potential for learning, but their differing family resources affects how challenging it will be for a school to develop that potential in the two cases, not whether it's possible to develop it, but how difficult it will be. The terrain of research on the educational impact of family and student resources is vast, but let me consider just two of the many different ways that family resources affect students' uh, educational progress. It is now very well known that the poverty of a student's family affects the student's school engagement and performance. Students in poverty tend to be less healthy, subject to mental stress from their parents not having enough income, and may have housing instability or even homelessness. These and other economic-related disadvantages depress school performance. The COVID regime has both highlighted but also intensified these disparities. These conditions are not the students or their parents' fault, and to repeat, do not deny that a student can make educational progress, but as part of the way that class and race contributes to educational disadvantage. In addition, and independent of a student's own economically-based disadvantages, a student is further educationally disadvantaged if their classmates are also economically disadvantaged. That was something that Coleman actually uh, recognized as well. But um, economic disadvantage is not the only class-based source of educational disadvantage. Class-based processes at the top end of the income and wealth spectrum also disadvantage all those below that level. Advantaged families generally engage in what has, what has been called opportunity hoarding. The parents can buy educational enrichment, private tutors, college counselors, and the like for their offspring. They can afford to buy their way into wealthy districts with well-funded schools. They can use their class-based social skills and capital to advocate for favorable treatment for their children in their schools. As a result, wealthy students are educationally advantaged compared to their peers with less income, which is to say the economically non-advantaged will be educationally disadvantaged relative to the wealthy group. Advantaged families are not necessarily intentionally engaging in a collective educationally group advantaging project. Each parent might simply be trying to improve their own particular child's education. It's not necessarily wrong of these wealthy parents to do this, but they end up collectively contributing to group opportunity hoarding 
that sustains educational, racial injustice and inequity. Taken together, school site resources, resource disparities, and family student resource disparities are ways that the structure of race and class in society, white supremacy, and Mills ascent can be seen as the fundamental source of educational inequity. It's important to note, however, that it's not inevitable for wealth advantage to translate into educational advantage, although we're so used to it that we might think it's inevitable. And of course, the greater the degree of economic disparity, the more difficult it is to keep this from happening. Still, the degree of educational disparity can be mitigated. For example, the US does not have to have property taxes play such a strong role in school funding. That arrangement came close to being successfully challenged at the Supreme Court in a fascinating 1973 case San Antonio versus Rodriguez. The challenge failed by a mere five to four vote at the Supreme Court, and the justices in the five person majority added insult to injury by rejecting the idea that the Constitution of the United States provides a right to a good or decent education. In other words, they said the Constitution does not provide that right. Since that unfortunate ruling, Legal and political struggles over school funding have shifted to states, and as, as a result, many states have significantly more equal funding formulas than they previously did, although the continuing basic reliance on the property tax puts a break on the degree of improvement that's possible. And although poverty will always have deleterious educational effects, we can choose to have less poverty. The white supremacy perspective allows us to see that seriously reducing poverty, apart from being a good thing and a just thing in its own right, would improve school performance too among formerly low income students. And reducing poverty should be seen as a school reform po policy. And I think that the Biden administration is seeing the poverty reducing aspects of the COVID relief bill from, from a year ago and the Build Back Better legislation that hasn't gone through yet uh, in, the, in this uh, school reform way, the poverty reduction of school reform. To say that a society is white supremacist, therefore, is not to say that it has to be that way. Almost no one who believes that the US is white supremacist in Mills' sense thinks that society has to be organized so that white people are the advantaged racial group. We use the idea of white supremacy as a critical tool to help us understand the injustice of our society precisely so that we can change it and so that schools and education can be part of that change. So in discussing these three meanings of white supremacy, I'm not saying that Mills's view is the right one and the other two are wrong. All three are legitimate uses of the terminology of white supremacy and they're all picking up something of social and historical or historical importance. But because the idea of white supremacy is used in three different ways, there's always a danger of misunderstanding. This is the kind of thing philosophers are often pointing to if, if people are using a sort of very charged term, but with two different meanings, they're sort of talking past each other. Many people who, <laughs> Many people who hear the expression white supremacy may, might think of the Ku Klux Klan in white robes, burning crosses, the Charlottesville demonstrators, or the January 6th insurrectionists. And they might therefore think, well, that's bad, but all but a small minority of Americans have rejected white supremacy in that sense. Of course, one of the truly disturbing things we've learned from the last few years is that this old style classic white supremacy has quite a bit more vitality in American life today than being, morally con than being merely confined to a small minority. Um, uh, white, white supremacists in sense too of people who believe that the US should be run by white people for white people is much more widespread than most of us recognized uh, prior to Trump's election. My point here is simply that white supremacy in Mills' sense is something different from this and from Jim Crow segregation in important ways. 
Mills emphasized that if you want to use the phrase white supremacy and get people not to think you are accusing them of being members of the KKK, you have to recognize these different meanings and make clear which ones you are using. Okay. Now, someone who's defending, so going back to the idea of integrationism, so someone who's a, a kind of sympathetic with the integrationist perspective might reply to this argument that white supremacy rather than segregation causes racial uh, inequity, and, uh, causes educational racial inequity by saying that the following. But white and middle class schools do have better resources than low income schools with primarily black and brown students. So wouldn't it bring those stu students closer to equality with the white and middle class students if they attended the same schools? This is an understandable question, especially given that this in integrationist way of thinking is close to being the common sense of our time about education. I have a three part re reply. First, even if we had an integration program that bus some urban black and brown students to surrounding uh, predominantly white schools, it would still leave many students in inadequately resourced schools with nothing to offer those students within the scope of the integrationist argument itself, which provides resources only indirectly by means of the integration process. Point two, uh, or sort of answer two, even for the students who would benefit from those programs, you know, who were in the integration programs, the envisaged integrated schools could not possibly close the resource gap even among the students in those schools. Since the argument does not involve improving the economic situation of the low income black and brown students compared to their well, uh, their well off classmates, they will still have comparative familial economic disadvantages that impede their educational process, as I talked about before. And conversely, the well-off families will still expend much of their capital helping their own individual offspring, offspring in ways that do not help the other students in the school. So even on its own terms, this argument cannot plausibly be regarded as achieving equality or equity. Point three. But the most fundamental point is that the rejoinder concedes that it's resources that matter, not a school's racial demographic. And those resources are unfairly distributed in the first place along both class and race axes. The, the resources in question are, as mentioned earlier, of both, of both the schools and of the students. If we could reroute some of society's resources to a poverty minimizing program, using instruments such as the child tax credit, as President Biden's Build Back Better bill seeks to do and his American Rescue Plan did do last spring, that would address the problem independent of any integration initiatives. And at the school end, if we emulated other countries where local property taxes are not the foundation of school funding, doing so could equalize school funding among low income and high income communities without any change in the racial demographic. International comparisons show that the US is one of the most unequal societies in the Western world and in the global North. In terms both of its weak safety net in general and with respect to educational disparities between top and bottom income levels. In other words, the US has a greater gap, a gap between the top and the bottom, both economically and generally, but also in terms of educational in terms of educational performance. More generally, without recognizing the injustice of our race and class-based system, we cannot tackle the resource inequities the integrationist argument does not challenge and, and essentially leaves in place. So I haven't had much good to say about um, integration, but, but my criticisms are not really of integration itself, but of false hopes that have been promoted in its name and the worry that the real requirements for equality of education will get sidelined by integrationism. However, once we reject these false hopes, we can see that there's a vital educational reason for bringing racially distinct student populations together, namely to provide the most favorable setting for civic education, education that helps prepare future students 
for engagement in a multiracial democracy. Civic education is a central function of our education system in this country. In this country. Traditionally, American citizens have looked to the public school system as the core institution training the next generation of engaged citizens to make democracy work. Since the 19th century, education has been looked to to help form a sense of unity and common purpose among youth of different backgrounds and circumstances, especially given the unusual ethnic plurality of Americans compared to European nations. Of course, this vision, especially in the 19th century, but into the 20th as well, omitted both blacks and indigenous peoples. But its, its, its multiculturalism can, to, at least to some degree, be repurposed to include those groups in the present. Until recently, polling revealed that Americans continue to see civic education as a core purpose of schooling. But in recent decades, these civic purposes have tended to get sidelined. There are several reasons for this. This is a much larger conversation, so just a few points here. One is an uh, overemphasis on standardized testing and therefore of the subjects that they have developed standardized testing for, like language arts and, and math, rather than civics and civic education. Two is a narrowing of the value of education to economic values such as job preparedness or equality of opportunity to compete for jobs in the marketplace. And that is a, that's a kind of outgrowth of neoliberal thinking. And then the third point is an increasing polarization in society, leading teachers and schools to avoid controversial subjects that some of their students or their parents might object to. There, there's been a welcome counter, counter movement to the pushing of side of civic education in this sense in the Black Lives Matter uh, era, starting in 2014, that is before uh, the George Floyd murder in, in 2020. But uh, the, the protests, the, the, the kind of revival of the Black Lives Movement in the wake of George Floyd's murder also led to more teachers wanting to teach more about race in their class in their classes than they had done before and approaching curriculum development groups such as Facing History and Ourselves to help them to, to uh, incorporate race into their thinking, into their teaching. Okay, so the, the, the book, um, Integrations, goes into a fair amount of detail about civic education related to race, and I can't really do that here, but I'll mention just a few important components of it. Civic education involves at least three categories of learning. Knowledge, developing capabilities for civic participation and what I call civic attachments. In the knowledge category, traditional civics courses focused on political institutions and political history with the role of the citizen largely confined to voting and petitioning their elected representatives. Civics is now recognized as having a significantly broader scope for example, the role of popular social movements in political and social change is acknowledged as a key aspect of civic knowledge. Race-focused social movements such as abolitionism, slave resistance, various civil rights movements, not only of blacks, but of all the communities of color of the 20th century, and the more recent Black Lives Matter movement are central examples that are core elements of basic civic literacy and knowledge about race. Two, in the capability category, civic education helps students develop competence and efficacy in civic engagement. For example, students can research issues facing their communities and schools, such as understanding how schools are funded, and can meet with public officials to press evidence-based proposals for, say, funding formulas. Students can also take civic actions, such as demonstrations, to protest what they see as inadequacies or injustices related or not to their research. And they can, and the school can use the classroom to help them sort of reflect on the civic activism that takes place outside the school. Three, in the attachment category, civic education aims to help students form a sense of respectful connection to others of diverse backgrounds who will share a polity with them, be it a city or a nation or even a neighborhood. 
Having very briefly laid out some elements of civic education, we can see in light of them that integrated schools and classrooms are vital resources for civic education about race. This connection was made in a set of guidelines the Obama administration's Departments of Justice and of Education published jointly in 2011, and I quote from it, racially diverse schools provide incalculable educational and civic benefits by promoting cross-racial understanding, breaking down racial and other stereotypes, and eliminating bias and prejudice. Now, of course, civic knowledge can be taught in any racial demographic, including an all-white or an all-black or all-Latinx or indigenous classroom. Nevertheless, a racially integrated classroom is a more favorable environment for it. For many white students, studying social justice movements may be just one more historical matter they have to master for their exams. But when they're able to recognize that those historical movements affected their classmates and their classmates' ancestors, and thereby the character of the society they themselves will inherit when they leave school, they are more likely to experience that um, learning as meaningful and to retain it. The, the, the racial groups are non-symmetrical in this regard, since students of color do not have the same need of the white students in order to understand the importance of those movements. Nevertheless, if social movement education includes, as it should, the role of allies of the groups at the center of such movements, allies of other racial groups, very much including whites, the presence of white school peers should enhance the civic education for the students of color as well. Regarding civic competencies, having students work in interracial groups on race-related projects is likely both to make the projects more meaningful to all parties, to increase understanding by having more diverse perspectives within the working group, and to help form bonds between students across racial lines. These bonds are also an integral part of the creation of civic attachments that are part of civic um, education. Since the students will and do live in a multiracial democracy, learning to connect with those of other races, to regard each other with respect, and to see all as fellow citizens or fellow re residents of the same political society is a crucial educational task, one that is almost impossible to accomplish in schools that are overwhelmingly of one race. Such bonds can be nurtured by skillful teaching in integrated schools in the day-to-day -day interaction among students from different um, racial backgrounds. And, and this part of my talk today and, and of the book was based on the, the teaching that Professor Bolesky mentioned that I did at my own local uh, high school for four semester teaching course on race and racism to an extremely racially uh, diverse classes during that time. And that, that's where I'm, I'm seeing the, the power and potential of the kind of integrated classroom for the civic and moral purposes. In the integrationist tradition, minority dominant schools are seen as problematic and well-resourced upper middle class schools presumed to be largely white, though often not stated as such, are the gold standard. But the civic perspective helps reveal how educationally disabling white dominant schools often are, no matter how high their test scores. Such schools are almost sure to reinforce white ignorance, a term that Mills used, a failure of its students to grasp the true nature of the society those students inhabit, a reinforcing of, dominance, of, of damaging stereotypes, as the quote from the Obama uh, Department of Justice and Education mentioned, and a failure to see the systemic racism permeating the society, an aspect of civic education that the Obama document does not mention, I note. Um, positive outcomes for civic education will not happen automatically with the mere co-presence of multiple racial groups in the classroom. It makes demands of more teachers to become racially literate themselves and to learn to be skillful in guiding racial discussions in racially plural classes. It's, it, it demands a lot from teachers and uh, teacher education programs really need to kind of be incorporating those, those skills into their teaching. 
School administration, professional development programs, as well as those teacher education programs must support this effort in the service of, of civic education about race. So in conclusion, or a partial conclusion, I've argued that integration in integrationism diverts from the real requirements for equality in, edu in education, and that once integration is freed from its barely existent links to equality, its value for civic education can be appreciated. But I want to close by discussing a development in the civic education area that began in earnest last year after my book was kind of in production. Um, it was finished and handed over to the publisher. In about 34 states, out of the however many we have, 50, um, in about 34 states, legislation has been introduced to restrict the teaching of what would generally be understood as anti-racist education or racial justice education, or in my formulation, civic education about race. In 14 of those states, that legislation has been passed, and in the other 20, I mean, this, this changes every day, so you know this could be slightly out of date. 14 of the states have passed them, and I'll mention eight of those states, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Iowa, New Hampshire, Arizona, Idaho, and South Carolina. The legislation takes somewhat different forms in different states, but there are also many commonalities, in part because several conservative think tanks have been involved in drawing up what's called model legislation, and they share that legislation with their allies in state legislatures. I want to talk briefly about this legislation because it would strongly curtail the kind of education that my, my co-author Zoe Burkholder and I built a case for in the book and that I've been advocating more briefly in this talk. A very important commonality in the bills is the expression divisive concepts, banning teachers advocating that students adopt those concepts or in some states banning even introducing those concepts to students. Here are some um, of those, some of the, uh, the, the divisive concepts. The United States is fundamentally racist or sexist. Two, an individual by virtue of his or her race is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. Not one. Members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. Another, an individual by virtue of his or her race and sex bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. And another one, the final one, any individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any form of psychological distress on account of his or her race or sex. The divisive concepts idea der derived from a document produced by the Trump administration and published in an executive order in September 2020, that is kind of close before the election. It was rescinded by President Biden on his first day of office, but has essentially been resuscitated by the state level legislation I'm referring to here, which often refers to the same list of, of uh, divisive concepts. This legislation strikes at the heart of the teaching profession. Whatever the specific language, the legislation is aimed at preventing teachers from teaching what they know to be the truth of American society and history and forcing them to tell students things they know to be false. It, it is an assault on the integrity of teachers. The legislation is aimed at any perspective that says that racism and racial injustice are an important part of American history and life, and that learning about that systemic racism is a vital aspect of civic education that every American student should be instructed in, in school. The real target of this is, um, is racial literacy. Um, as a racial literacy, as a, uh, or, or, or the real target is racial literacy, that is to say, taking racism seriously. Um, so, what, what, 
racial literacy, sorry, as a um, civic and an educational imperative. This is connected to the older discussion of white supremacy because you could say that the intention of this uh, legislation, I mean, one of the intentions of, of the uh, legislation is to preserve white supremacy in Mills's sense. That is to say, not only to see America as being kind of racially stratified with a lot of uh, inequities, and then taking that as a reason to try to change it to make things more equal. The, this legislation is, aims at disabling students from understanding that structure, and therefore, in a certain sense, it aims to preserve that, that white supremacy and, em, and embrace it, essentially. That doesn't make it the same as Jim Crow segregation, but it's, it's bad. The list of divisive concepts is crafted so that the literal and first glance meaning of the st statement seems reasonable, but in fact is worded so that it would be very difficult for a teacher to teach about race while being sure that they did not violate the law in question. So to take uh, the example that I read to you, quote, an individual by virtue of his or her race is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive whether consciously or unconsciously. Taken literally, almost no one believes this statement, since almost no one thinks people are born with prejudices by virtue of their racial origin. That is to say, no one believes that anyone is inherently racist. The whole point of racial justice or anti-racist education is to help people prevent, reduce, and even wipe out such prejudices, or that's one point of it. And we assume that this is possible for most people, and certainly for most students. We would not engage in anti-racist education if we really thought that people were inherently racist. However, inherently can be a slippery word, and many conservatives think that if you say someone is racist or racially prejudiced, you are saying that they are inherently racist. You aren't, or aren't necessarily, but they might think you are or say that you are, and if you were a teacher, you would be aware that some parents of students in your class, upon hearing from their child what is going on in your class, might well object, tell the school administration or the local school department or school board, and you might well end up being sanctioned or even losing your job. To take another example, an individual by virtue of his or her race and sex bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. I am sure almost no teacher literally teaches students that a person in the present is directly responsible for causing a wrong perpetrated in the past by members of their racial group. You are only responsible for the bad or evil that you yourself actually do or could have prevented in the present or the future. However, suppose the teacher is teaching something quite different, that some white people in the past instituted oppressive structures such as slavery, and her current white students now live in a society in which the harms of those structures were never fully corrected for. And therefore, current white people reap the benefits of the injustice that white people who had no personal relationship to the student perpetrated. Do current white people have any responsibility to deal with these current unjust effects of past wrongs? This is a very complicated question. It doesn't have a simple answer, but it's an important question to think about, to talk about, and to teach about, and to learn about. It should not be dealt with by preventing teachers from their responsibility to engage with such historically and morally important issues, guiding discussions of such uh, complex matters. The teacher might be worried that if she did do that again, that she could be sanctioned or lose her job. Okay, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. How would you account for films? discussion of dominionism or a theocratic impulse or even just school choice 
Could you touch on those, either from your own right, perspective? What was, the, what was the first one? Dominionist. That is uh, the sense among evangelicals that they are chosen by God to organize society around. But and if I mean, if you could, how would you think Milne? would interpret this also because there seems to be embedded in those impulses some other issues involving potentially, you know, white supremacism of different forms. You know, um, I mean, the issue of, there's a general issue of how you teach about religious diversity in schools and evangelicals are part of American life, and um, you know, this is not directly in my area of expect expertise, but I think it's important for students to learn about the multiplicity of religion in the U.S. Now, you know, many religions would have aspects of their teaching that might slide over into a racialist or a racist worldview, and then you know, because religion touches on other things, there should be a way of saying, we're not saying that people, that it's wrong to be an evangelical Christian, but we might be saying that it's wrong to believe that certain groups are inferior. You know, that you're, you're coming from a kind of civic, racial literacy perspective, and you're bringing that to the religious pluralism education. But that doesn't answer, you know, there's a lot of questions left over, but I'm just saying that's like one way you might get into that. On, on the issue of um, school choice, that's like a really, that's an extremely complex issue. It's not so much an issue as part of a curricular dimension, but more you're saying the politics of education and how to think about that. And um, I don't know if I want to open up all that. I do, I do think there are some racially problematic dimensions of the anti-public school aspect of the school choice movement, and especially Betsy DeVos's role in it. I mean, she was the head of the Department of Education, but she basically was hostile to public education. So there was kind of irony. Um, and so, you know, in, in a larger discussion of that, you would want to be able to call out those links between the school choice movement and racism. That's not to say that everything in the school choice movement is racism, but but thank you so much. Um, I suspect in the, those, at least a, a majority of those 34 states that there hasn't been so much a cultural shift as a political structural shift in terms of gerrymandering. Um, and that structural shift has created or allowed for this new kind of political strategy, um, which is to pass legislation that is divisive but has no political accountability because those districts are now, um, you know, relatively safe for them in the long run. Should we be focusing all of our attention? And this strategy, I, I think, would not work in competitive districts. And so should we be focusing instead our energy on making sure we're going after gerrymandering um, to prevent legislation like that from coming up in you know, probably be less than a dozen states then? Um, you know, it's not an either or thing. I completely agree with you about the importance of gerrymandering, and it has resulted in fewer and fewer competitive districts, but it's also resulted in more Republican dominance. Both, both of those things have happened, and it's tremendously important to fight against it, and I'm sure you're very well aware there's like a whole movement that has both a grassroots dimension, it has a dimension of mathematicians weighing in on it. There have been a lot of challenges that you're in which I'm sure you know, in some cases, 
courts have rejected gerrymandered maps that state legislatures have brought to them, or that someone has challenged the map that the legislature came up with. But that is a very, that's a very important part of the American political terrain of the moment. I completely agree about the importance of doing it. I don't want to take uh, energy away from worrying about these racial things too. It's that both and grab that identity door. But I do want to say one thing is that the legislation I'm talking about is less affected by the gerrymandering because it's all at the state level. But the gerrymandering is primarily gerrymandering of congressional districts at the national level. But, but still, I mean, there is also internal gerrymandering and a thing that's happened, which I'm not sure is entirely resolved gerrymandering, but that more states have um, legislatures controlled by one party than previously. And when you have that kind of control, you can introduce more extreme legislation. And, you know, you're absolutely right in terms of the, the vitality of democracy, you want to have competitive districts. That's like more democratic, and the country's actually been moving in a less democratic direction. Anyway, thank you. That's it. A great question. Thank you. So I, I was intrigued by the, um, at one point you said that a predominantly white institution of education, let's take a university, uh, is actually educationally deficient based on the premises about civic education, the diversity of, well, let's just say a university should, let me just step back. So those two young people talking about coming from predominantly white high schools, I see that across the board in my own teaching. I ask students this because I do teach critical race theory. Mostly inspired from what happened with George Floyd, I sort of got woke. I was already woke, but I'm white privileged. This university is white privileged, white advantage, white powered. Just look at the stats. My question is, uh, by definition, Quinnipiac University is an educationally deficient institution because does it really have a strong well, when I compare it to UMass Boston, where I went, and then went and did my PhD at UNH, two different worlds in terms of diversity and the energy. But um, I guess we should be teaching critical race theory as part of a first year experience or across. We should also be then teaching critical financial theory, critical wealth theory, right? So what is the role of theory in bringing, bringing a, a more robust and I suppose more equitable Institution of higher education, if that makes sense. Theory. Okay, so um, you all at Quinnipiac have, have hosted me to speak here, and so I'm not going to say anything about that. You know, but also, I wasn't, in a way, I wasn't really talking about the university level. You're, you're not wrong to take implications of what I said, but I was really talking about the K through 12. You know, the K through 12 level has, you know, of, of required education right, no level that everyone has. But still, I'm, you know, I am a college teacher. As you say, I, t I teach at UMass Boston, which is a, it is a much more diverse uh, institution. It has, you know, many more work, work by students as a state university. Um, and I do think it's important to have critical perspectives in all subjects, so to speak, right? So I'm, I'm focusing on race here, but, you know, as you can tell by my thinking that class has an important, is an important component of racial disparities, that I think class inequity is like a serious concern in its own right, and gender as well, and, you know, many other domains. So. I, I am very much in favor of people teaching those courses that introduce students to a critical look at American society. Thanks.
Thank you. I think our time is almost up. I had a question, but I think it was answered first by Jada and then Tim's question and what you've been saying at the end. I was just going to quote Lenin and say what is to be done. I think you've given some hints, but I'm wondering if you can give us a real guidebook in short. You and I are both philosophers, and philosophers aren't necessarily that great at figuring out the, the practical element. But I will say that with respect to this legislation that, you know, I'm really alarmed by this legislation that, I, that I've been talking about. And I would look to official teacher organizations, especially the two unions, but also like the Association for, for Social Studies. You know, there are all these professional associations by, by subject that the K-12 teaching forces organize in. And I'm not seeing, I mean, I don't know if it's just not being covered in the mainstream media, which I read, but I'm, I'm waiting for mass demonstrations led by these teacher groups to protest against this legislation. And I'm, I'm unnerved and I haven't seen it that much so far. So I don't know how to make that happen, but that is a thing that I do think would be, you know, if teachers really took a stand in those states, I mean, the legislation is meant to terrify teachers. So that's part of its strategy, is to terrify teachers and make them not feel empowered to join together to protest. But that's just what you need a union for. 